Good afternoon. I can't complete with that lot at the back there. Aren't they brilliant? Aren't they brilliant? But did you see that guy last week? The guy at that, the royal wedding, doing that amazingly sort of passionate preach. I wish I could do that. I really do. I wish I could, could do this sort of message on, on love and marriage and, and so on. But God never gives me this kind of theme stuff. He simply said, tell you a parable and then talk about me. Here is a story. Like in about the late 1980, no, 1880s, in the northeast states of, of America, just inland from Boston, in New England, there lived a guy called Emmanuel Nenga. Now, Nenga was a very respectable guy. He worked in insurance. He went to the local church. He was part of the civic society, but he, he kept himself to himself. He lived alone in a neat little house on the edge of town. And was, although people, people respected him rather than liked him, because nobody really knew him, he was what you'd call a pillar of society. So it was a surprise to the community when Nenga was arrested for passing a forged $20 bill. A lot of money in those days. And it came as a great shock to them when the police searched his house and found, built into the, the roof of his house, a little forger's studio. There was an easel with a great big sort of magnifying glass over it and a, and a, a genuine $20 bill pinned to it. And on the other side was a, a half-completed one with another magnifying glass. And then a little tray with pens and inks and stuff like that. And a little stool on which Nenga sat painstakingly going from one to the other, copying this $20 bill. So, of course, Nenga's arrested. He's, he's put on trial and he goes to prison for 10 years for forgery. And while he was in prison, when he was sentenced there, his family came from Boston to kind of sell his house and to empty the, the contents. And his brother goes up into this little room. Now, the police had taken all the stuff, the, uh, the evidence and so on. But what the guy found sat in the corner were three paintings, landscapes. And his brother thought, well, they're quite good. He got my brother's signature on the bottom. So he took them back to a friend of his who had an art gallery in Boston. And the guy thought, they're brilliant. Yeah, they're really good. Put them up for sale. And these landscapes sold each one for about $10,000, $30,000 in total for these three paintings. Small fortune, worth half a million dollars in today's currency. And when the brother went in to see Nenga in prison, Nenga told him a story about these, these paintings. He said, I used to get so frustrated in this tiny little cell that I'd, I'd, I'd built, no windows, he couldn't let anybody, you know, light get out to let anybody see what he was doing up there or ask questions. So he'd put himself in this little cell and he'd get so frustrated that he needed to burst out. And so sometimes when he couldn't stand it anymore, he'd go out into the countryside with his sketchbook and, and sketch a little local landscape and take it back and then just as a, as a break, paint it. But what became obvious was that it took taken Nenga about half a day to paint each $10,000 landscape. It had taken him all week to forge each $20 bill. See, Nenga had a talent that was within him. He had something that was there, but he never believed in it. He never trusted it. He had something that was in him, a gift that could have, if he believed in it, sustain him in life, sustain him to an abundant life. But he didn't trust it. He didn't recognize it. So instead, put a lot of time and effort and stress and pressure into forging a $20 life. How sad is that? But the parable element of this is because you look around at the world around us, that's exactly what we see. We see so many people put in a huge amount of effort into constructing $20 lives because they don't really believe in that what's within them can sustain them in life. They're consumed by things called low self-esteem, lack of worthiness. And we spend so much time, therefore, forging a life that will look right to people on the outside. 
It's what drives us down to the gym. Well, not me. <laughs> or to the tanning salons. Equally not me. In order to make, create this idea that if we look good on the outside, we can convince other people and probably ourselves that we're okay on the inside as well. We spend so much time trying to, to make the world out there think that we're okay because we don't believe that what's within us can sustain us, is worthy enough. And I get that. I get that. Because for the first 40 years of my life, I did exactly that. I forged a $20 life. I didn't believe that what was in me could really make me admirable or acceptable in the world's eyes, so I forged it. Now, a lot of people do it differently. It might make them pursue them towards money and get into the top of a career. With me, it turned me into a people pleaser. I thought if I just do things for people, then people will look at me and think, what a nice man he is, without ever questioning the fact that they didn't really know what was going on beneath the surface. I guess Nenga must have felt that when he left his sort of civic society in his church meetings, that people would say, what a nice man he is. I just hope that nobody dug into him to order to see what his life was really like. It also made me conservative with a small c. I didn't take challenges, didn't want to come out of my comfort zone. Not because I was particularly scared. I didn't drive till I was 40, for example. Not because I was scared of driving. I just didn't want the idea of failure. I stayed as a classroom teacher in the secondary school my whole of my career, telling people I didn't want to be a, a head of department or anything like that. I wanted to stay in the classroom where you could be close to the kids, where you could make a difference. It wasn't that at all. I didn't, have that, I didn't have that much caring in me. I didn't know how to do it. I stayed there because I could do that bit. I didn't want the responsibility of promotion and possibly failure and people judging you. See, there was nothing really in here that I felt could sustain me. I didn't trust it. My parents had never put anything into me that you would call a faith, nothing, nothing spiritual. They weren't religious, didn't, weren't for and they weren't anti. They were just nothing. So I, I grew up with, with nothing about faith. Having said that, I always believed in God. Not because I wanted something within me, but simply because it made more sense. I've never understood atheists. I've never got them. Atheism makes no sense to me. Of course something started this. We're not sitting in a church thinking it built itself by accident. We didn't put a pile of bricks down and blow it up and hope that in a few million years it will transform itself into a church. That doesn't make any sense at all. We know that somebody built and designed this church. However, that doesn't mean we've got to have a relationship with them. Let alone build a religion on them or get down and worship them. No, I always believed in God. God had created everything and then trogged off to do something else. Do another universe or whatever. Perhaps he was dead. I didn't care. I would have called myself a Christian because I had a bit of water sprinkled on my head when I was a baby, so I thought that was all it took. So I kind of believed in, in God out there somewhere. I'd had a bit of water thrown on my head, and if there was a heaven, I was probably going because I'm a decent person. That was it. That was my spiritual self. And I would have probably called myself Church of England on a passport application. And my wife, Liz, would probably have done the same, except she would have put Catholic, because that's the way that she was brought up. And that's how it went. Till 1987. When Liz met this girl, talked to this girl called Gail, who she taught, and asked her what was different about her. And Gail had said, I'm a born-again Christian. So she started going to Gail's church. It was a little happy, clappy church. Locally, down in, down in Oswald Twistle, of all places. And she started going down there. I didn't want to go. It was nothing to do with me. I didn't want any part of this. But then one day in 1987, she came back to announce that she'd become a Christian, which I thought was a bit strange because I thought you already are. You're a Catholic. How can you become a Christian? What was strange, I'll be honest with you, is that Liz has four brothers, one in America, one's a music teacher in Warrington, and the other one at the time was a GP in Salisbury. 
And the two in this country both became Christians. They've been brought up Catholic, obviously. Both became born-again Christians in the same week that Liz did, but in three different parts of the country without any communication with each other. So I thought that was a bit weird. I thought that was strange. But when you're forging a life, you can cope with stuff like that. You can paint it into your little $20 forgery and call it coincidence. Even if you don't get it, if you don't really believe it, you can file it like that. I had no problem with that. It's just a bit strange. I met some people from Liz's church. A couple of the guys came up. They came up to talk to her, but they'd really come up to talk to me. I knew it. They came to convert me. And I was having none of it. They were lovely people, and I hated them. I hated these two guys, although they were ever so nice and very polite, because they seemed to have something solid, and I didn't like that. I thought, how dare you? I'm the one with a degree in political philosophy. I'm the respected school teacher. How can you make me feel more empty than I'm seeing in you? I didn't like that at all. It rattled me, so I wanted them. I was rude to them. I was very rude to them. I'm not normally like that, but I was dead rude to them. And so 1987 became 1988, and it came to Easter. Liz had carried on going to this church. I pretended I liked it, or I pretended I liked to go in. I didn't go. But I didn't really. And in Easter, Good Friday, 1988, she conned me into going to, her ch- or going to a church, not her church, but a big local church in Great Harwood where all the Happy Clappy Brigade had a get-together called the Good Friday Convention. And you all gathered at some big venue, and they all started celebrating. So she said, because I didn't drive, because I didn't take on things like driving, would I go as a navigator? Otherwise, she was going to get lost. So I thought, well, okay, I'll go. And that's how I came to be in that church. Understand that I did not go with any, any slightest intention of looking for God. I was not interested in God. I did not have this hole within me that I needed filling. I had nothing. Why well, went out of curiosity? I wanted to have a look at the born again Christians. I thought they would be strange. I thought they would be, they would be a bit wacky. I thought they'd be wandering around with silly grins on their face singing Kumbaya or something like that. And when you're fake in your life, like I was, you like observing other people. You like sitting in the corner and watching other people because it makes you feel superior. Look what they're doing. And that's what I thought. I go and see these weirdos. So we went into this church. The Christians, by the way, were alarmingly normal. That disappointed me. They weren't sort of crazy and weird and hello and all this kind of stuff. They were just normal disappointingly so. But I still sat at the back. I sat on the very back row, near the door, so I thought if any of these guys or any of them come across to me and start trying to pray, doing this stuff, you know what they do, these Christians do, they go, oh yeah, hello brother, can I pray for you and starting shabba dabba doing all over you? <laughs> I thought, I'm out of here, I'm out of here, I'm close to the door. But they, they, they didn't. And we sat I sat in this church, in this back row, service began, there was some worship, there was some music, and I thought that was all right, it was a bit more lively than the boring hymns that I remember doing at school, I happened to sing when I was... I think there was some drama, there may have been a testimony, and then this guy got up and he talked for what I'm trying to do today, 22 minutes, something like that. He got up to talk, and his subject, because it was Good Friday, was Jesus. Jesus dying on the cross for me and what he went through and why he went through it. Now understand, I have no problem. I had never had a problem with God. God's okay. But I had a big problem with Jesus. Jesus offended me. I couldn't cope with Jesus. I can cope with God because you can paint him in your poetry as a little smudge in the sky somewhere up there. But Jesus is, is real. Jesus, if Jesus is real, he's he's in your face. And so I would get very upset about Jesus. And since then, by the way, I've I've met a lot of people who do exactly the same. You can talk to people about God and they'll have no problem. 
They'll talk to you. You can talk about anything to people. I believe in God. I believe in fairies at the bottom of my garden. I believe in unicorns and all this kind of stuff. And they'll have no problem. But as soon as you say, I believe in Jesus, they get offended. Oh, my goodness, Jesus rattles your cage. I've seen people's faces change when you mention Jesus. I've seen teachers at school talk about God with a smile on their face. Oh, you're interested in that, are you? And as soon as you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, they start snarling. I've seen one sort of go like a, like a demon. Mm. Just at the mention of the name. So I've always had a problem with Jesus. And here's this guy talking about Jesus, the one I had a problem with. But I listened to him. And Liz is sitting next to me, apparently holding her breath, because she's thinking, he's still here. He hasn't run yet. But what was going on, really, when I was... It was like missing me and him in this room. And I was just listening to him. And I remember thinking, as he went into this 22 minutes worth of stuff, if what he's saying is lies, I'm okay with it. I can live with that. I can cope with it. It's a good story. And as an English teacher, I'm used to telling stories. But, and it's a big but, if there is the slightest, slightest chance that what he's saying is true, that Jesus died on a cross for me, that suffered and died, for, if there is the slightest chance that that is true, then that's a game changer, isn't it? That is a game changer and a half, that one. If God thought that there was something in me that was worth dying for, it challenged everything that I thought of. What am I doing constructing a, a fake? Why do I need to be a people pleaser? What's going on here? So I remember saying as we got towards the end of this message, look, if this, is a, if this could be true, I need to know. So it came to that point where the guy said, close your eyes. So I did. I didn't put my hands together or do anything like that. I simply closed my eyes and I said to God this. I said, if you are real, God, and what this guy has been saying is real, you're going to have to show me. And what's more, you're going to have to show me now. Because if you don't, I will leave this church and I will process it somehow. I will paint it into my little forgery and I'll go out and say, when I get back to school the next week, Oh, I went to one of these meetings. Oh, they all had me going for a minute there. I will process it somehow and make it part of my forgery. So you're going to have to show me now. And as that clock ticked on to six o'clock, on Good Friday, 1988, God did. Now, there was no booming voice. There was no flash of lightning. No ringing of bells. No angels swooped into that church and started doing dances around my head. I didn't fall to the floor, burst into tears. I never felt there was a great burden lifted off me. Any of that stuff, the nearest I can describe it to all you people here, is I can imagine some guy in hospital with total amnesia, lying in a hospital bed, bandage around his head, total memory loss. And around the bed is his wife, his, his father, his mother, and his kids. And he's looking at them, and he thinks... I hear what you're saying, I see your face, but you know, I just don't know who you are. There is nothing in my memory bank that connects me to you. I don't get it. And then, at that same moment, getting a slap on the head for some reason, and whatever was disconnected in his head, suddenly connecting. And then thinking at the instant as that clock hits six o'clock, I know who you are. I get it. I recognize you. And that's as near as I can get it. I knew that what I'd just been told was true, was real. That God loved me. And that's a shaker and a game changer and a half, that one. That Jesus died for me. That God is that good. That God has a plan and a purpose for my life. And it's not involved in sitting there painting $20 forgeries. That there is an abundance. I didn't understand anything more than that. Get this. I didn't understand anything more. I didn't get this revelation about the whole of what life was about. I still had the same questions. Noah's Ark, do you believe in that? Adam and Eve, do I believe? Do I get that? No. Why do bad things happen to good people? Dunno. I had no answers to that. I understood nothing. I just knew that God was real. Jesus was personal. God died for me. That's all that I knew. I never went forward. I never put my hand up. 
I never stood up. I felt no need to go down to the front of the church. So I'm not going to have an altar call tonight. You'll be pleased to know I'm not doing that. Because you haven't come here for that. I never went forward because there was no point. I just knew. And I left that church knowing that. Didn't pick up a halo at the door. So I then become this perfect person who never made a mistake ever again in my life. That was 30 years ago. Oh, I've made plenty of mistakes. But it was the foundation on now which I build everything. And I'll close with this. I did one thing. One thing after that. The next day, I don't know if Liz remembers this. We went around to see a guy called John. He was a history teacher at the, at the school I taught at, Haslinden. And he was the school Christian. There must have been other ones in the school who were Christians, but they didn't have the bottle to stand up and declare it. John was the one who did. And he got a lot of stick because of it, and I gave him a lot of stick as well. But he was a good guy. He's the one that I talked to when Liz said she'd become a Christian. He didn't kind of push it down your throat or lecture you or anything like that. He was just a good, wise guy. And I thought I needed to go around and see him. I knocked on his door the following morning, on that Saturday morning, and he just opened the door, and he looked at me. And we didn't say a word. He just stared at me and said, you know, don't you? You know. And I looked at him and said, yeah, I do. Yes, I do. And so can every single person here. See, one of the reasons, this is the nearest I'm going to get to saying anything about weddings, one of the reasons that I love this church and I stick in this church, these two people here. Because they are the real deal. There's no $20 fake about them. And when you see the real deal, you know what you're looking at. I know <laughs> there are Christians who don't get it. The Christians who tomorrow will come into churches all over the country and they'll put on a, a church mask because they don't really believe that what's in them is worth dying for. And they still feel they need to work at it. But every single person here needs to know, like these two guys know already, that you can be the real deal. And so I just pray for these two that God blesses you, continues to bless you mightily, and that God continues, God will bless every single person sitting here. So God bless you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>